I'm Cliff Lynch, the director of CNI, and let me welcome you to our fall uh, 2011 uh, member meeting. I'm delighted that so many of you are here. Uh, we've been blessed with pretty good weather. Um, I'm not aware of any major weather hangups going on around the country right now. Um, I am, of course, concerned that we are building up a karmic debt and, um, you know, think, thinking about um, record snow in April or something for our uh, spring meeting in Baltimore. But anyway, we'll take it while we can get it. Um, I have a number of uh, logistical things I just want to touch on before getting to my main remarks. Um, and uh, for reasons I'll get into in a minute, um, we have a little less time than usual, so I, um, I want to kind of move things along. So I would like to welcome you all here. Uh, I think that you're going to find this to be quite a memorable day and a half. Um, I'd like to especially welcome a number of international members and uh, guests that we have joining us. Um, it is not always easy to do those international trips, and I am uh, grateful that they could make the effort to be here with us. We have a number of new members or rejoining members um, that I would like to take a minute to recognize. Uh, these include um, Lafayette College, the University of Wyoming, um, the California Polytech, Wichita State University, Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville, the University of San Diego Copley Library, and Wake Forest University. And I welcome those institutions. I had an opportunity to um, meet uh, reps from at least some of them at the new members session earlier today. And uh, it's great that they are here with us. This has been, uh, th there, are few, there are a couple of things that um, have been changing that I just want to make quick note of. Um, over the course of the summer, we did a major um, rebuild of the CNI website. Uh, many of the sort of um, visual characteristics um, uh, are, are maintained from the old one, but um, I think you will find that the new one is a great deal cleaner, um, more convenient to use, and uh, much more effectively navigated. As part of that, we also cleaned up a number of other things. Um, you will note that this fall, we finally um, took our fax machines out to pasture and went to an email-based registration system. Um, there were actually some reasons why we kept the fax machines as long as we did, not just, not that we liked fax machines. Um, but anyway, that's all over. Similarly, um, I, I will not make mention of um, evaluation forms in your packet, because there aren't any. Um, you will get one of those in email in due course after the meeting. Uh, so there have been a number of these kinds of, um, of small things that we've had an opportunity finally. Well, actually some of them, like the website, were not so small. Um, but uh, some of these important maintenance things that we have gotten done. Um, despite the um, favorable weather, I want to just make mention of the message board um, by registration. If there are changes um, in the breakouts for some reason, we would, we'll post any changes there so that you know. Um, there is also information on wireless connectivity uh, if you need it at the registration desk. There's a, a one page handout available. Uh, the last thing I just want to mention in terms of housekeeping is that we've changed the format of the meeting a little bit. Um, this fall, we got probably 50% more proposals for sessions than we've ever gotten before. Plus, there were a number that we wanted to invite because they 
dealt with um, things that we wanted to get on people's radar screen because we thought were important. And there was just no way we could fit them in the number of breakout session slots available. So we debated what to do about this for a while. Um, we considered having several series of breakouts starting at like 6 tomorrow morning. Um, <laughs> decided that was probably not optimal. Um, and so what we ended up doing is tightening up some of the breaks um, this afternoon, notably the very long break that usually follows this session, um, and slotting a third series of, a, a third round of um, parallel sessions in. Um, we'll still start the reception at about six o'clock, so the, um, the end of the day stays the same, but what you'll have is um, uh, three um, rounds of breakout sessions with somewhat shorter breaks between them rather than two rounds of breakout sessions and really long breaks. Uh, one of the upshots of that is that I really do need to be finished here at 2.15 promptly. Um, and I do want to allow time for questions, so I'm going to try and limit all of my remarks to about um, 40 minutes here. Uh, so this should be good. Um, so what I want to do in these remaining um, uh, 38 minutes or whatever I have is really to give you a bit of um, kind of the year in review and uh, look at some of the major uh, trends that we're tracking and to talk a little bit about how those connect up with our program and our program plan. You'll find our 2011-12 program plan in the white packet that you received at um, registration. It is also, as of this morning, up on our website. Um, and I'll just note that if you would like um, additional copies of the glossy printed version to share with um, colleagues at your institution, uh, just let me or Joan know and we can um, we can get some for you. I know that some of our members have found that to be um, a useful internal communications tool. So that's where I want that. That's what I want to do in the next um, in the next little bit. And I I sort of struggled with the place to start. Um, there are you know. There are these fascinating macro trends that are going on right now. Um, uh, this whole sort of um, debate about how um, how how much um, higher education should tilt towards the vocational um, issues around the legitimacy of um, various areas of study, um, particularly when they are subsidized by public investment. Um, uh, they're, they're the whole question of how you demonstrate uh, and quantify economic impact, job creation, um, all of this stuff is sort of swirling around um, at a macro level and um, framing, you know, a lot of things that we have on our plate. But um, I don't really want to spend a lot of time on that other than to, to note that I, I think there really are some very serious um, uh, conversations going on that will shape the kind of broad future of the higher education systems especially in this country, but also to note that, you know, if you look at the institutions represented here, they are a relatively limited part of that big higher education system. And um, I, I think that um, uh, while, while they will not be unaffected, um, that, uh, that they, they will have more flexibility, I think, to um, to choose how to respond to this than some other parts of the system. Um, I think the place where I, I, I've concluded that I want to start um, in, in terms of, of things that are really directly um, on CNI's agenda is to sort of note that this, this has been the year when big data became fashionable. 
Um, I mean, how many times have you heard about big data in the last six months? Um, it's on the cover of things like The Economist. Um, uh, you have, you know, the New York Times running pieces on big data. This is really, um, uh, you know, an idea that I think has started to capture the public mind in very interesting ways. And it's certainly an issue that, um, you know, we here have been out in front of for a number of years, but it's one that's taken on um, uh, greatly in large dimensions and um, that you can actually talk with people about now outside of, you know, our profession. Um, I think that there are two lessons kind of in the, in the year of big data that, um, that we want to be mindful of. One is that not all the data we care about is big data. Um, it's wonderful to have these sort of, you know, conversations about how my exabytes are bigger than your exabytes. But um, I, I think that, you know, when we really go out and look at what's happening in the world of data-intensive scholarship, um, data-intensive scholarship is not the same as big data-intensive scholarship. Big data intensive scholarship is a rather narrow slice. Um, so much of the, the information that needs organized and cared for um, really, you know, fits pretty comfortably on smallish disks and uh, lives in tools like Excel, Excel spreadsheets. And I think we need to kind of remember um, uh, that that data is really in many ways the most intellectually challenging because it is so diffused throughout the system of scholarship and because in many cases um, the, the investment sort of per data set is substantially smaller. I mean, if, if you're signing checks for a Large Hadron Collider, um, you, you know, you're going to ask where the data is going. Um, now we've now we've gotten to the point where if we're giving out grants, we ask where the data is going in in terms of the NSF data ma management mandate, for instance. But um, really, we're going to be moving on in, in, into scales even smaller than that. I think. So. That's one thing I think we need to keep in mind. The other thing I think we need to keep in mind is that coded into this kind of big data rhetoric is a lot more than data intensive scholarship. There's a whole agenda of machine learning and prediction and classification that is implicit in a lot of this discussion of big data. In other words, <coughs> You can make scholarly discoveries, certainly, through machine learning and classification and finding correlations and relationships, but you can do lots of other things. You know, you can run societies, you can predict, you can sell stuff, um, you can sort people in different ways. Um, and I think that um, one of the things we're seeing and one of the reasons there's so much interest in this suddenly beyond the scholarly world is that um, people are recognizing that this is a very, very powerful set of technologies and tools for a whole variety of commercial and governmental agendas as well as, um, as, well as simply scholarly ones. Um, we've even seen that in uh, the emphasis in our own institutions now on analytics, um, classroom click streams, uh, predicting students at risk. All of a sudden we're moving from um, scholarly uses of very large data to very operational kinds of things. And uh, these come with their own um, very real issues, I think, about privacy and um, uh, about what uses are and are not um, appropriate. We had the National Science Foundation mandate go into effect in January. So 
the campuses represented here, at least from the U.S., have now had just about a year of experience dealing with this. Um, we're still trying to understand a lot of things. Uh, we're trying to understand exactly how review panels treat these. We're trying to understand what guidance to give to faculty who are preparing them. Uh, one of the things that um, has been notable in, um, in the sort of collective response to these mandates is efforts not just to develop sort of general best practice, but actually to develop tools that can be customized for different funding agencies and for different campus environments that actually will assist faculty in developing these plans. And I think that's a very, um, a very high leverage uh, kind of um, activity. I want to note in this connection also um, that there are two calls which I have shared out to the CNI announce list from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. One call deals with public access to um, journal to journal articles describing um, research that has been publicly funded, uh, the the um, NIH mandate and and where that should be headed and whether it should apply to other fields. Um, the second, which is the one I want to really bring to everybody's attention here, is a call for um, for public input on um, data sets that are produced as a as part of publicly funded research and how what what um, what policies should accompany those data sets um, how they might best be preserved um, whether disciplinary or institutional strategies should come into play here the role of government um, and interestingly some questions that I think are exceedingly difficult to answer um, that deal with the economic impact of access to this data. Does this help to grow businesses, to create jobs? Um, the cutoff date for comments on that is early January. Um, as I say, you can find links in the CNI Announce archives or a number of other places, but um, I'd urge you to think about whether um, your institution or you as an individual, it's open to individuals and institutions, um, want, to, uh, want to express a view on this. I think that um, in this room, certainly, and in the institutions represented in this room, we have an unbelievable um, depth of knowledge um, and insight about these issues, and um, uh, they are indeed important ones. Um, I also want to note in this connection um, a couple other things that are going on in the uh, big data world. There, a couple of years ago, the um, National Academies established a board on research data and information. Um, got, it goes by the acronym BIRDI, B-I-R-D-I. Um, and um, that, was, that was initially chaired by uh, Mike Lesk of Rutgers. Um, he, has, um, he has rotated off, and I've agreed to co-chair this board for the next uh, couple of years with um, Fran Berman, who um, is the former director of the San Diego Supercomputer Center and is now the vice president of um, research at uh, RPI. I think this is another opportunity to look broadly at policy um, uh, ramifications of a lot of the big data movement, a lot of the um, issues that we're familiar here um, uh, with dealing with um, uh, data curation and data reuse. And uh, I, would, I, would look, I would urge you to look forward to um, that group also uh, helping us to um, connect up with other policymaking and scientific and scholarly communities uh, to help understand this. There's some other real interesting stuff happening, and I don't have time to go into huge detail in this, but um, I, I, I think we'd be remiss not to note it. Um, we had a plenary here 
not long ago from Liz Lyon from UKOLN, where, among other things, she highlighted um, some of the developments that she had been tracking in what's often called citizen science or public engagement in science. And I think, um, actually, uh, Bill Michener tomorrow in his closing plenary will probably um, touch on some of that as well. It's very, very interesting to see how this is gaining momentum. Um, there's clearly a movement here with some significant force behind it, and I think it's one we need to track very carefully because um, it promises a kind of a broader reconnection um, between academic research in many areas and the, the, the broader population in the U.S. Um, you might recall, for example, a um, system called Galaxy Zoo, which I think uh, uh, Liz had a slide of, or you may have seen at some other meetings. This is basically a system that teaches people to classify galaxies, and then they, um, they are shown galaxies and classify them appropriately. So this was such a success that the people who did this um, have gotten a bunch of funding to build a whole series of other games, basically taking their, um, their experience and packaging up this kind of citizen engagement and applying it to a range of other fields. Um, fascinating development. Uh, the other one um, which really has gotten my attention is the whole set of issues around genomics and especially personal genomics. The cheap sequencer has become, you know, the CIO's latest nightmare, joining things like backhoes and uh, other things and you know, haunting their dreams. Um, these things, um, it, it's getting really cheap to sequence genomes. And um, these things pump out horrendous amounts of information, like around um, 30 terabytes per genome before it's matched up and, and paired and reassembled. When you get all through, you only have a few gig out the other end. But the kind of raw data that needs to get fed from the sequencers to the computational apparatus is tremendous. And if you look at the curves here, they are much worse than the Moore's Law curves. Um, we are developing the ability to sequence much faster than to compute and, and reassemble the sequences, which is an interesting development. Now, what's happened is that um, there is a whole set of genomically based medicine which basically to a first approximation says what you want to do is get sequences for individuals and we can't quite afford to do this yet at scale but it's clearly coming within the next few years. So you want to get sequences for people including all the variations in that sequence that make them individuals and then you want to get medical records. And then what you want to do is do the most amazing calculations you can imagine over, uh, you know, entire populations of genomes and medical records and try and figure out what patterns of variation correlate to what conditions and what treatments are effective given um, various kinds of um, conditions and uh, uh, genomic variation. These are computations on a scale that are just, um, you know, mind-boggling. Um, and as you get into complex things where it's not just, you know, one variation um, basically causing a disease, but, um, you know, maybe 50 variations causing a statistical um, uh, predisposition to one, um, you need the resolving power of enormous um, uh, numbers of observations to do this. So we're starting to have a series of policy conversations bubble up about what, who, who owns your medical records, who owns your genome, um, is, it, um, is it reasonable to link them, and um, uh, how, how anonymous can that be? 
um, if you want to provide these huge sets for data mining? And the answers here are, needless to say, quite complicated, but also are, they look like they're going to be a gating factor on, um, on biomedical discovery in the next couple of decades. I was in the UK um, last week, uh, and while I was there, the Prime Minister basically made an announcement that it was his intention to see that all the medical records in the National Health Service, remember they have a National Health Service, um, we just have you know enormous um, hospital complexes, uh, so you have to deal with several of these. But basically everybody was going to be a research subject unless they opted out. Um, all these records would be available for computational mining. And um, that's a wonderful thing, and it's also a kind of a disturbing thing. Um, you may have noticed that uh, right now you can get yourself genotyped for a couple hundred bucks from 23andMe or a number of other companies. And there are people who are taking the position now, I'll put my genome up. Um, some of them will say, sure, I'll put my medical records up too. Um, most of them right now are, you know, probably the genome's enough. Um, I think there is, I, I can readily see that there is going to be a very interesting set of conversations uh, showing up here that bring together policies around data mining, around, um, around privacy, around data curation. Um, uh, that are going to have some fairly high stakes for the research enterprise. And um, I just ask you a couple of questions. If you were going to put your medical records on deposit, um, and side question, who owns medical records for dead people? Um, you can compute, you know, on these just as well after people are dead. It's still good data. Um, where would you feel good storing them? Um, would you feel better storing them with your insurance company or your local library? Just something to think about. Uh, I, will leave, I will leave that there other than to say I, I think that there's a lot of interesting issues that are going to show up. Um, Big data is rippling in a lot of other directions, too. Um, for all the progress we've made in high-performance networking, data seems to be growing way faster than the networks. And um, you're seeing a lot of investment in trying to think about how to move data from place to place. Um, you're, um, you're certainly um, seeing conversations also, though, about data that's too big to move. And, you know, that sort of once it gets there, it has to stay there because there's no way we can move it other than maybe ship a lot of tapes on an airplane or something. And even the time to write the tapes is intractable in some cases. Uh, this, is, this is very interesting, and it connects up quite directly to some of this talk about clouds and cloud services. When you start talking about clouds for very high-end data, um, it matters which cloud you're in. You don't move from one supplier's cloud to another casually. The um, bandwidth constraints and the, the time it takes to replicate data is, is such that there is some significant lock-in um, to be dealt with um, if you're thinking about clouds as a potential solution here. Um, we see this propagate in lots of other directions, too. You know, just to name one, um, access management. Now, we've taken sort of the first steps around access management with federated identity management, but when you start thinking about custody of complex research data across time, you actually wind up with a nasty uh, mixture of individual and role-based um, access rights that cross institutions um, that need to be preserved here. We know very, very little about this at this point. We don't even, I think, have, have particularly clear statements of the problems. Um, but I think we'll see work showing up in that area as well. Here's another 
sort of large-scale development that I'm seeing, um, and, I, and I'm seeing it with some momentum, and it connects up just like big data to a range of agenda items for the coalition. And this is what, I would all, what I'd call sort of the new scholarly communication movement. Um, there have been a whole series of meetings and workshops over the past year, year and a half. Um, a sort of a um, motley self-declared crew of technologists, scientists, publishing people um, uh, who have started to come together and really talk about how we take the next steps in changing the scholarly communication system. Except that the frame of the conversation is quite different. This is no, this isn't primarily an economic conversation. So the agenda here is not open access, although I would say many people come to these discussions with a strong bias that says that ultimately a system that is open access based, um, however it's funded, is liable to occur for other reasons. But instead, what these folks are interested in, I would say, is really sort of a tripartite agenda. Um, one part is sorting through the relationships between scientific publications, and I would say these folks are mostly focused on the sciences, not the humanities. So they're interested in the connection between scientific publications and the underlying data. Um, how those should be related, um, the tools that would be used, the citation or pointer mechanisms that should be used, um, all of that. And tools are a very real issue because you do want to be able to do at least some simple things um, that, that are sort of like computations localized in the paper, like graphs of a data set. You really want that to just sort of be automatic in there, but also manipulable. So the question is, how do you get from here to there? The second piece of the agenda is really about formats and, again, about tools. It's, it, it doesn't have a clean break line with the questions about data, but it's about how you write papers that don't simply emulate uh, the papers of the 1920s and 1930s, um, how you write papers that can be, that are, are enriched by being read in a computationally mediated way, and papers that understand that they have readers that are human and readers that aren't human, uh, but are computational. And then the third piece of this um, agenda is a set of issues about what I'd loosely call peer review and impact. Um, and they're really, uh, an, another way to think about them is um, helping people to allocate attention um, and helping people to understand the impact and reach of their work. So this includes thinking about various kinds of measures of impact, but one particularly salient kind of idea that seems to be emerging is the notion of people taking some responsibility for their own kind of um, scholarly identity, which includes their bibliography, um, probably some brute facts about their biography, and um, uh, connects all of these up. And it's quite striking to look at developments across um, Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic, um, Microsoft Academic Research, Elsevier Systems, um, Web of Science, all of these are starting now to give you tools to clean up your uh, bibliography, to disambiguate and um, uh, authors or identify authors that shouldn't be separate. Um, unfortunately, right now, they don't propagate changes from one to the other, um, and uh, we're still lacking some vital pieces of infrastructure here. Um, author IDs for one, and there are a couple of interesting initiatives in that area, most notably ORCID, um, which um, are, are looking to plug some of that gap. But I think that we're starting to see the emergence of a whole set of 
tools that um, sort of support this idea of public records of publication and the ability uh, of individuals to take control of those records. Um, and uh, um, CNI has been quite active in some of those conversations of late. I want to simply note the discussion about outsourcing, clouds, scale, cross-institutional activities, um, uh, web scale discovery. Um, <coughs> there's a whole um, array of um, conversations there that clearly have gained a lot of momentum. Um, I think that right now there is at least as much talk as real action there. I think that there are some formidable um, challenges in the area of understanding risk and understanding lock-in um, in these settings. Uh, I think that um, we're, gonna, we're going to come to realize that um, selecting and joining clouds is going to have more to do with selecting and hosting communities than we might have realized in the past. Um, uh, some of that is going to be driven by the realities of bandwidth. Some of it's going to be driven by the enormous um, diversity of kinds of service that the different clouds are offering. They're not really very substitutable right now. I do want to move on, though, because there are just so many areas that I want to comment on. Um, the whole notion of digitizing collections and making them available as a basis for a conversation with an audience or a community is one that we've come across numerous times over the last five years or so, the um, placement of photographic collections on Flickr, these kinds of things, Flickr Commons. <clears throat> it's striking to me how much traction this has gained. Um, there's a recent OCLC study that um, um, Karen Smith Yoshimura and uh, Cindy um, Shine from Getty uh, put out um, that does something like 75 case studies of institutions who are using these kinds of tactics of user-enriched collections. I think that my sense unscientifically is that this is gaining more traction in the museum world than the library special collections world or, or others, but I think that this is a a model that we really need to continue to investigate and exploit and that has some very natural connections back there into um, uh, public science and into um, sort of humanities versions of public science, public humanities, if you will. Um, <clears throat> another thing that's crossed some sort of inflection point this last year, I think, has been ebooks in um, popular publishing, if you'll allow me, the mainstream commercial publishing. I don't know what the best thing is to call it, but it's very clear now that the level of commerce in ebooks is such that it's starting to restructure. Um, a good deal of the economics of publishing. Panic is setting in in various quarters. Um, uh, folks with some long-standing ambitions are actually having opportunities to see those realized um, for better or worse. Um, right now, most of the action and anguish as it affects the cultural memory organization world is limited to public libraries. Public libraries are just having a horrible, horrible time um, uh, with ebooks because uh, the publishers are basically declining to do business with them at all or declining to do business on terms that remotely, you know, resemble the historic economics of public libraries um, acquiring material. This is a real serious problem for public libraries um, and it's, 
it, it's one that's very hard to know what to do about, um, uh, particularly short of some sort of, um, of reinterpretation of, of copyright law or something. Uh, but it's one that I mention here in part because I don't think this is going to be limited to public libraries. I think that we are seeing the beginnings of a very nasty mess in mainstream commercial publishing, um, which includes a tremendous amount of material that's essential to the cultural and scholarly record going forward. These are things that end up in our research libraries as well as our um, public libraries. And there are things that we're not going to need. We're not going to need just today, but we're going to need two generations from now to understand a lot of what's going on in our culture. Um, when was the last time you saw a coherent discussion of how we are going to preserve mainline commercial ebooks? I have. I, I don't even see those words mentioned in the um, the, the debate about you know um, how about the, about squeezing public libraries out of the ebook market, and yet that's a debate we have a very high stake, I think, collectively in dealing with. Um, there are other places that we better watch out for too. Um, the used book world is going to go away as another byproduct of this. Um, and that has implications that um, I think are, are very substantial for the um, long-term access to, uh, to um, the cultural record. The last um, kind of event I'll point to in that world is all of a sudden pieces of the market are falling out of the control of the major um, publishing players too. Um, you are seeing a tremendous number of do-it-yourself authors, um, many more than we used to see and with a much greater reach. We're also seeing successful authors, on the other hand, withdrawing out of the publishing system in some cases. What the implication of this is that it gets harder and harder to track down and identify um, the scope of these kinds of materials. Uh, you know, once upon a time we had tools that helped us with this that I think are getting very, very shaky at this point. There's more to say about this, but I think the, the place where I'd leave this is that um, it behooves all of us to pay attention to what's going on in this area and to recognize that um, this is not a issue that is going to be limited to public libraries, although it may start there. In terms of preservation kind of issues, I th there's again a tremendous amount we could talk about. I just want to note two things. The use of social media of various times various kinds continues to go through the ceiling. Um, uh, people are spending an incredible amount of time on these systems and communicating through these systems. With the exception of Twitter, as far as I know, we have almost no meaningful strategies for preserving any of these. And we don't seem to be making much progress in this area. This is a problem that is getting bigger and bigger and um, I, I, I think is, uh, is one that um, really should be worrying all of us. Um, I also just want to note an event that I thought was quite striking and that snuck by with less discussion than I would have thought. Um, Apple earlier this year with their transition to OS 10.7, without really making any real announcement of it, pulled the plug on basically all software for their machines that hadn't been updated in uh, recent years, all of the PowerPC-based and earlier.
programs, um, a remarkably large collection of work. And, you know, this, this was one of the sort of most striking examples of deliberate obsolescence on a very large scale that I can think of. Um, what was so amazing about it to me was that they didn't say anything about it in advance. They just sort of did it. And people didn't really talk about it that much except for a few people who, who were tracking what's going on. But um, I think that you know the scale of this really invites us to ask some serious questions about policies about planned obsolescence and, and commitments to availability um, for uh, the operating systems we use. Um, it's getting to be too large a scale issue to ignore. Um, another way of thinking about what they did is that they just handed us a phenomenally sizable digital preservation problem. Um, all these things used to work just fine. It actually wouldn't have been that expensive to keep them working, but instead we did a very big move all at once into the, this is now preservation material. Um, this, the scale of this is probably something that would benefit from some study. And just to swing into the last um, set of comments I wanna make from there, I think it particularly bears some study as we look at what's going on in the mobile environment. Um, mobile applications are very hot. Um, certainly, we've seen a phenomenally rapid uptake in tablets based on Apple's uh, iPad technology. We've seen a very, very fast uptake on smartphones. What we've got here, though, is um, you know many of the worst characteristics of the um, PC wars from the 80s reasserting themselves with um, uh, apps that aren't portable, poorly specified things, proprietary things, walled gardens. Um, and yet, uh, you see some things that really give me a lot of pause. A very popular activity right now seems to be to taking, take content and package it in an app so that it looks really good on something like an iPad. And on the one hand, this is a wonderful browsing experience. On the other hand, you've now tied that content, potentially. You've tethered that to a set of assumptions about platform, um, about stability of platform, about software obsolescence, um, in ways that you know, we spent 20 years learning not to do um, by you know, developing um, content standards that are very separate from software standards, um, things like XML and HTML. Um, so I think that um, it's really worth thinking hard about some of our content strategies as they apply in the mobile environment, uh, particularly for those of us who are concerned about the longevity of content and to recognize that on the flip side, we are going to be faced with, I fear, a whole new and difficult set of preservation uh, challenges that arise out of this mobile environment. So this is a set of trends that, um, again, we're going to be continuing to track closely. Uh, we did an executive roundtable about a, um, uh, about a year ago, looking at strategies for um, uh, for campus approaches to um, to mobile technology, and it's very clear that um, institutions are really struggling with this question about how far to go down the app pathway and how much to um, insist on treating these more like little computers and saying, use a browser, use content independent, um, uh, use um, content standards that are, are independent of platform. Um, I, think, I, I think given the potential impact of mobility, um, this is actually a pretty 
significant crossroads we're coming up to. So these are a few of the big trends that I've been watching over the last year. Um, there are plenty more we could talk about. Um, uh, but um, these are probably, I think, among the most important. And I think you can see how every one of these ties quite specifically into agendas that CNI has been pursuing over the last few years and will be continuing to pursue into this program year. Um, I would hope that many of the aspects of these trends that I described aren't surprises to you. These are actually things that we've been talking about collectively and thinking about for some years now. And that while they are developments that are gaining momentum and gaining impact, they are not developments that are blindsiding us. And I hope that we at CNI can continue to help to ensure that as we try and um, understand and shape these developments together, we are not blindsided. Um, perhaps to use another metaphor that I just loved, um, uh, we can offer you surfboards for riding the wave of data, as um, a recent uh, report from the Knowledge Exchange uh, suggests of their program to uh, deal with data curation challenges. I'm delighted you can join us for this meeting, and I can assure you that um, for everything I've touched on, you will find lots more detail and lots more insight among the sessions scheduled for the next day and a half. And I've actually managed to finish with time for a couple of questions. Thank you. And there's a mic there, or if people want to shout, I can repeat for the recording. Uh, the question is whether I could talk a little more about um, why this new world of mobile apps, uh, why I believe that's going to lead to more, um, more um, preservation problems. Um, I think, I, I guess to me it feels like we are um, recapitulating a lot of the late 80s and early 90s here with a enormous number of applications um, that are specialized in many cases to more platforms than the market's going to be able to support. Um, I mean, it's very hard for me to believe that we're going to see more than two, maybe three um, mobile platforms. Um, so what you're going to see, I think, over the next um, five to ten years as things straighten out. And I'm actually thinking it's going to be more five than ten um, because the rate of change just seems to be so fast in this area, um, is you're going to see a lot of orphaned content that got wrapped up inside of applications that want to run on hardware and operating system platforms that just don't exist anymore and that nobody's thought to um, preserve the content in portable form so that we're going to wind up um, with a delightful array of emulators for proprietary, um, you know, uh, mobile phone platforms and things of this nature. That's, that's a lot of what I worry about. Um, and, um, you know, some of this content will be significant. A lot of it 
frankly, will be repurposed and it doesn't matter very much. You know, um, if you read the newspaper on here, it's probably just a reformatted newspaper that's stuffed inside an app. Um, and there's a big database somewhere that's the definitive newspaper. Um, and the only part you care about is a little metadata that says, and these were the three articles they pumped out as the top of the news last Thursday onto the handheld. But you're going to see a lot of other creative content that will be built natively here and, and not replicated elsewhere, I fear. The note. Cliff, you said earlier today that um, the circulation of e-books by public libraries are posing a particular challenge. What kind of a model do you think would be sustainable in the circulation of e-books amongst public libraries? Well, I mean, um, sustainable is an interesting word there because the question is sustainable for who? Um, I mean, I, I, you know, frankly, I'm not, I, I, I'm not, it's not clear to me why following a model very much like what you're doing in print isn't sustainable, uh, where you actually get a copy for about the same price you get on the commercial on the con standard consumer market you'll loan it out to one patron at a time um, and uh, you know you you can keep loaning it pretty much forever um, that 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 kind of revenue stream was pretty sustainable for printed works I think there's actually more profit overall in the the scheme for um, for electronic works, and it, it feels to me like some variation on that ought to be sustainable. Um, I know that um, uh, one of the major publishers proposed a model where basically they attempted to um, uh, emulate wear and tear and have the have the book self destruct after what was it, 20, 22 or 26 circulations or something? Um, and that just seems so intrinsically barbarous to have a book self-destruct. I mean, it's just, you know, I, I just can't see it. Um, uh, you know, maybe, maybe going to something that slows the rate of circulation or, or something, you know, that's, that says that you only get to circulate it every five days or something. Um, uh, during the first year you have it so that you have to buy a few more copies of something that's in high demand. You know, I think there's some room to move there um, if, if you had to. Um, uh, but um, I, I think models that, that, that include self-destruction just really bother me. And models that, that meter are, you know, that, that provide a disincentive to the library for doing more circulation are, are really problematic. Uh, if you had to put a little friction in the system, uh, I'd think of it in terms of rate of, you know, rate of circulation or something like that. Um, I, I do think there are a lot of other interesting um, developments floating around there, like um, given that almost nobody can make a living being an author anymore, and many people are doing it sort of for ancillary reasons, some of them just for the love of it, um, this begs some real interesting questions about perspective, rela direct relationships between authors and libraries that um, I'll be very curious to watch in coming years too. Um, and I, I should also say, you know, that um, the, the kind of baseline thing I just talked about um, uh, as, as a potentially sustainable model, um, at least to my naive eyes, um, there's no reason why you can't um, fancy it up a little to take advantage of situations where libraries want to channel a little more money into meeting demand spikes. For example, as I understand it, it's quite common now if you get a very popular novel or something to have a public library buy a number of copies of it and then in a year or whenever the you know interest in it dies down, they'll keep one and you know the other four go out um, uh, on the friends of the library sale, um, you could easily emulate those kinds of things 
in a pricing model if you wanted. I think I have time for one, maybe two more questions, depending on how long they are. Do I have any takers? No. OK. Well, in that case, uh, grab a quick refreshment. And uh, remember, this is a short break at this meeting. On to the next session. Thank you. <laughs>